My name is Andrew Bry. I'm on the go-to-market team for uh, Chainlink Labs. We help different protocols and teams integrate with the Chainlink uh, open source protocol. Um, and then from time to time also host community events like these. Uh, so once again, thank you guys so much for showing up. And I'd like to introduce our panel. Um, we'll go from left to right. Um, Mr. Brad Cam from Unstoppable Domains. Brad, please wave. That's Brad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll get to you. <laughs> um, and then we have Michael Anderson from Framework. Um, give it up for Michael, founder. And then Brianna Montgomery from Fay Protocol. Um, she's the founder and on the business development team uh, over at Fay. So please give it up. Um, I'm going to stop sweating and start to sit down. So appreciate you guys for um, all your patience with me so far. Um, how are we feeling tonight, guys? Feeling good. Doing well. Good to hear. Um, I think it might serve well to just give the crowd a bit of context of how you guys got here, maybe um, started in crypto or Web3, and um, where it's taking you guys to this point. Uh, Brianna, would you like to kick us off? Yeah. Um, OK, the microphone is working now. All right, let's you go. You guys missed my joke <laughs> earlier, but it's OK. No rug pulls <laughs> with the audio visual system. We're good to go. Um, hey everyone, I'm Brianna Montgomery. I'm on the founding team of Faye Protocol, which is a decentralized, scalable, algorithmic, reserve backed stablecoin. I know it's a mouthful. And my journey here started with traditional advancements in software for FinTech, which led me to software and uh, I'm sorry, security. And then I ended up managing the audit team at Consensus Intelligence before Faye. Thank you, Michael. Cool. Um, so Michael, one of the co-founders of Framework Ventures, we're a Web3 venture fund that uh, builds alongside the investments that we make. Um, Chainlink is one of those investments. Um, really kind of got the start in, uh, well, previously I was a, a product manager working at Dropbox and Snapchat, so kind of have a tech uh, background and um, got the start in Web3 uh, early on in the Chainlink ecosystem, and, and that kind of expanded into other uh, protocols like Synthetics and Aave. Um, so feel like DeFi was kind of the place that we got started, and, and it has since expanded into other categories. Hi, everybody. I'm Brad. I'm one of the co-founders at Unstoppable Domains. Uh, we build domains on blockchains. They are NFTs stored by you, so you own them forever, uh, meant to be your decentralized identity. Uh, I got into crypto. I moved to San Francisco in December of 2012. I moved into a hacker house called 20 Mission. How many people were here at the last Chainlink event? OK, wow. Uh, it is worth retelling the story then. Um, so uh, when I moved to San Francisco, I moved into this uh, hacker house, 40 person, uh, 40 person building. Um, a bunch of crypto founders were there. I think the second Bitcoin exchange was launched in the basement of the building. There was an early Bitcoin media channel there in 2013. Uh, Vitalik gave a talk in the courtyard before Ethereum went live. Pretty much everybody was in some way, shape, or form involved in crypto, and I went down the rabbit hole then and always knew I'd eventually get into the space. Uh, finally did so uh, in 2018. And somehow that building is still there. It hasn't been bulldozed yet, but they used to have parties until like 6 a.m., and uh, uh, they even shot a horror movie in there. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for sharing your stories. Um, the first question, and this is a, a panel of founders, just so you guys all know. Um, and I'd, I'd like to ask uh, what it means to be a founder um, to each of you. I'd like to start with Brad, because I can retell a personal story between the two of us. Um, I was actually an intern. It was my first job in school at Talkable, um, which is a company that Brad had formerly founded before Unstoppable Domains. So I know he has the capacity to do this. I've seen him run many successful companies. Um, so I think he'd be a good person to start with. Brad, what's it mean to be a founder? Wow, that was the best tee up for a question ever. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm kind of like you. how how I, I'm how, proud of you. How awesome do you think you are? That, that's the question. That's the question I feel like I just got. Um, uh, so let's see. Uh, I think it's some combination of visionary and camp counselor. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah, it's a good answer. Um, well, out of the three of us, I feel like I get the founder light badge, uh, given that I started a venture fund. Um, but I get to work with founders day in and day out, and that's my favorite part of my job um, and basically all I want to do with my time. Um, I think what it means to be a founder, just from what I've seen from everybody else, is I like your analogy. I, I think the other analogy is it's probably the hardest thing that most people will ever do in their professional careers. Um, and so having empathy and, and understanding where people are coming from is kind of the, the perspective that we come from. Uh, and I really like the phrase that Mark Andreessen once said, you know, 
Uh, starting a company is kind of like chewing glass and staring off into the abyss. Eventually, you just start to light the taste of your own blood. Uh, and that's, that's kind of what it's like. Yeah, um, I think it's just like being passionate to influence, cha uh, to influence change and um, really take a risk to do something that you believe in. Was there a point in your guys' careers where you knew you wanted to make that switch, where you didn't want to be in any career of blah, individual contributor and wanted to take something on your own and really you know, make your own stamp and not have the, um, you know, maybe that safety net of someone else behind you, but you guys being out on the forefront? Uh, okay, I was going to say, I'll take that. So like I said earlier, I was running the audit team at Consensus Diligence, so I had a very nice pipeline of being able to meet like founders that just finished the code for their project that needed an audit that was going out. So I met again and again, like day and day, I'm on the phone with people that have their new projects, I'm hearing their ideas, what they're building, seeing if we can fit it into the audit pipeline. And for me, uh, meeting Joey on one of those calls was, was that moment for me. He really stood out. Um, compared to everyone else and was exactly what I said earlier, super passionate about what he wanted to do. Um, so this one was easy for me because uh, I was like the worst employee ever. And uh, when I was 16, I had a busboy job and I remember just like hating my boss and he was a perfectly fine person. He did nothing wrong. Um, so it was, it, was, it was pretty clear to me then that I would just be like non-functional uh, in a normal job. So I didn't have a choice. Um, so I just started companies you know, starting in college, and that was just always what I did. Yeah, I think for me it was uh, working from a couple of companies to other companies. Uh, as soon as your job becomes more than 50% political, it felt like I was banging my head against the wall every day. And uh, you just have to kind of wake up one day and realize it's not worth it. Um, but, you know, once you do go down that path and once you realize kind of the, there is light at the end of the tunnel, you're completely broken. You can never be an employee at a company ever again. So that's, that's kind of how I feel about it right now. And when you guys did cross the chasm eventually, what were uh, some of the initial challenges that you guys faced or getting used to that founder role? What do you think? Uh, you laughed immediately, Michael. I think we should go to you. There's something that came to your head. Explaining to your parents what you do every day. <laughs> I still work at the Bitcoin, so. Uh, yeah, my mom told me not to get a job at Bitcoin when I made the jump, so. I think not being sure whether you're failing or succeeding, and um, very difficult to tell uh, for quite a while sometimes, and uh, sometimes it changes in a given day. So like, you know, one hour you think you actually have something figured out, and then the next hour you think everything's terrible, so. That's, uh, that's interesting, psychologically. Yeah, I mean, things are always changing so quickly. Something that I realized early on was just the circle around you is extremely important. So making sure you have your like allies aligned. And not only is it being a founder, you're also bringing in all the people closest to you. And that was extremely important to accept Joey and I when we went through some of the hard times for the company. Is like we had this tribe of our allies and people that we, that we could lean on to help us get through it. And it's really important. Fully agree with both of those. I think the other one that I experienced and and I think is relevant is just being able to turn it off. You know, you, there are 24 hours in the day where you could be working. You have to sleep for eight of them eventually, and being able to not have work travel with you for the rest of the hours of the day is is a difficult thing, but it's something that's important. Thank you for those. Um, and I think the challenges might be a little bit more easy to pick up on, like they're, they kind of stare you in the face, you know, but when did you guys think you hit that point of success or what some people call the inflection point? When did, when did you guys think, hey, this is catching on, hey, we might have something here? At what point did you maybe know? Or has it happened? I, I think it has for all three of you. But. Yeah, I mean, I think like <laughs> we're just constantly into like innovating and evolving and growing. So I, I'm not sure if we're there yet. It's probably there tomorrow. Like we're always gonna keep going and, and changing. And I think with the merger with Arari Capital, we realized that we could do this with another team. We thought it was gonna come organically within the community, but we're like, hey, we have this opportunity. We can actually move quicker and, and do the things that we wanna do in this experimental, innovative way. So it's just being open to possibilities that change at a rapid pace. I think, uh, the, yeah, I mean, a day one mentality is sort of the only way to approach entrepreneurship, frankly. Um, and the second that you get complacent is the second that you start to die. Uh, and so you can't really kind of bring about this concept of, oh, we made it, oh, we did it. I think the ways that um, you do start to feel happy or feel like you're scaling 
uh, or when you start to have other people around the table with you, and you actually have, it's not just the two of you or the three of you, but now you've got other people that are working on the same things that you are working on, and, and that feeling of amplification is, is a really great feeling. Uh, I think we had a little glimpse somewhere in, so we went, uh, we went to market in January of 2019, and then I think in April of 2019, um, we uh, went like mini viral on like crypto YouTube, and then we saw this little bump, uh, and then a couple months later, it started going away, uh, and then we had a technology issue, and then it completely went away, and then that went into a little trough of despair somewhere towards the end of 2019, uh, and then in middle of 2020, um, we kind of crossed a threshold where we were pretty convinced that uh, we had enough customers that this was going to be a sustainable company. And the team was like 20 people or 15 people at that point, maybe 20. And um, that was the point, middle of the summer, where we said, okay, like we should actually make a plan and act like a real company at some point, um, like grow up, basically. And I don't actually think you should grow up before you get to that point. Like I think that's actually the right time to do it. You should like not care at all because um, you're just trying to find something important in the world. And then once you have that, then I think that's when you try to do all the growing up, scaling, hiring, HR, all that, all that good fun stuff. And what makes you guys most proud of the projects that you guys are working on? What's the thing that you guys are, hey, I do this, and this is exactly why? What's that? What's that? So we brought protocol controlled value to the market, and not only did like we're being able to leverage that and utilize it through like our merger with Rari Capital to be able to grow, but other teams have picked it up as well. But we're really setting ourselves up to use the PCV, and that was like super innovative of us to bring to market to create like this new platform for DAOs to be able to thrive from in the new formed the, the newly formed tribe DAO. I mean, for us, it's it's quite different in that. Our success is our founder's success, and so we have 87 portfolio companies and 87 founding teams, and watching them flourish and, and do things like uh, Ferrari and, and all the success that we've seen with the rest of the portfolio, it's, that's the most exciting part for us. Uh, I think my favorite part is the underlying uh, ideology. Like, I, I, really, I, really, I really love this idea of ownership, uh, ownership of assets, ownership online. Um, individual control, economic freedom, like this is like what gets me up every day. So I think that's, I think that's my favorite part. My favorite part about crypto in general, um, but, uh, but Unstoppable in particular. I was gonna ask you guys also the favorite part in general, but for Brad, it's, it's ownership and, and you know, really taking hold. Michael, what, what for you makes you proud of this industry? So I think what we kind of have an opportunity to do is reinvent not only just the architecture of how applications are built, but some of the core architectures of how systems work, whether it's DeFi in relation to finance, whether it's GameFi in relation to how games are built, um, whether it's infrastructure in terms of new computational or decentralized computational services. Um, there is a better architecture for application development out there, and, and I think we get to build the base layers of that right now, and we're starting to see some of that actually develop into real apps with real scale. And you? Yeah, I think like being able to scale to the mainstream it will be awesome once we get there, and like we're building for that right now, and I think that's extremely exciting as well. Um, and in hindsight, what do you think you guys wish you knew about starting a company? What? Another laugh, Michael, I want you to kick us off. Every, there's something immediately that you're like, oh, I wish I knew this. I was gonna, I, you want a second? <laughs> you, you're up. Um, so I think it's just going back to the point that I made earlier, just like be really, if you're gonna start a company, like be really nice to all your close friends, your mentors, your family, because you're gonna really need them like through the good and the bad times as well. Um, and also if you're thinking about starting a company, like talk to the tribe DAO, that's what we're, we're trying to do. We're trying to make it super easy for you to spin up a company and uh, we have a new product that's going to come out called a One Click DAO. Sorry, I needed a little bit of a shell. <laughs> one Click DAO. Oh, yeah. Oh, I think generally the, the thing that I've experienced is it's way harder and way more fun than you would ever expect. And so uh, as, you, as you start to dig in, you just be prepared for lower lows than you would have ever expected and, and also higher highs. Um, and so it's a spectrum of, of emotions and, and uh, it'll fray people to the edges and so that's why you need the support system. Um, but it's really fun to do it with other people as well. And so finding the right team, 
being to embrace the change is, is really, um, I, I thought I knew what I was talking about, but definitely didn't until uh, I started it. Yeah, I guess I would say, this seems kind of obvious, but I guess I would say uh, people and recruiting. And I think that there's like a theoretical version of a company where you're like building a product and getting users and doing all of this user testing and it's almost like kind of mechanical. And then the reality is just uh, people all day, all, all day, every day, even the engineers. It's all just people and trying to figure out how to get everybody to work together and all that stuff. Um, so yeah, that's why I said the camp counselor line. Um, I think that's like the most uh, surprising thing. And it's totally not the way that I think uh, you, it feels on TV, like it's not the way it feels on, you know, Silicon Valley on HBO, like it doesn't feel anything like that. Um, it feels mostly around, like it's not, you're not just like sitting in a room building some product and then like magically it gets noticed. It's just like all this grind of getting more and more people on your side slowly, employees, uh, people in your network, uh, customers, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, it's just people all the time. And I, I, was, I was thinking about this earlier as on my drive in. Um, what lessons have you guys taken from the previous Web2 route um, as like ways to scale companies? There'll be a second part to that question, but from our predecessors, what do you guys think you learned? I'm a bit distracted that you drive a car, so I'll let someone else go first. <laughs> Two hours away, stopped in California, way over. <laughs> uh, well, so I think there, I, I think there's like maybe not as many well, it kind of depends on what you're trying to do. So we're trying to be, you know, the Coinbase of the decentralized web. So we are a company. Uh, we're not trying to build a new paradigm for uh, governance and control. Like, there's a lot of interesting stuff happening there in the DAO world, but that's kind of, that's maybe like a slightly different uh, task or thing to, or problem to solve. Um, so I think the there's maybe fewer differences than are being painted, um, with the exception of, I would say, ownership as this key idea that you can like leave the platform no matter you know if you don't like what they're doing you don't have that power in a lot of web 2 and then just like the superpower of community although community is quite common in web 2 so like most of the things that you hear um, being hyped up as like unique to web 3 or not I would say like 99% really just the ownership thing um, I think you can like reduce a lot of crypto down to the ownership thing um, candidly so I, yeah I would say maybe slightly fewer distance uh, differences than um, is currently popular on crypto Twitter right now. I guess just to, to kind of take that a step further, I think with these DAOs that we're operating in, if we could translate over some of the accountability that comes from more of like a, a structure of like having a manager and having someone to report to, being able to have follow-up deliverables after meetings, being able to know who is like the point of contact for said thing that you want to happen, I think that's something I would like to see translated over in this flat organization that we're creating. It's the accountability aspect. I, I was literally going to say, in many cases with DAOs related to companies, and, and we, you know, both are very much happening and both are very much viable for the Web3 world, uh, in many cases decentralization kind of equates to disorganization. Uh, and so having a more structured environment for what a DAO is doing, everybody's swimming in the same direction. Um, but then the other element that I think is important is alignment of incentives. And you know maybe it's not talked about as often, but one of the one of the strongest structures that I think Web two uh, proliferated is just the concept of alignment through you know equity or or whatever whatever structure a company is kind of operating under, which didn't used to be the case for many many decades of corporate America. Uh, and I think aligning incentives across a wide organization of people with different perspectives and different skills is really the superpower that we unlock with DAOs instead of companies. They're com companies versus DAOs are basically the same thing, it's just that you have a global reach of a global concept of an LLC as opposed to an actual LLC that's based in the same area. And so that, I think, is the power of where we're going, and it looks kind of the same if you squint into the future, but uh, you know, alignment of incentives and, and organization is really what it comes down to. Thank you. Um, and this, this question is a little bit more for the, I guess, what's on the bleeding edge, but what might you guys be most excited for? It's alpha time. <laughs> One laugh. <laughs> Not all at once, but if there's something that, you know, 
really, really is exciting you if you think we already answered that with uh, what you're most proud of. That, that's, that's fun yeah, too. I feel like I kind of touched on a lot of it. Um, I was talking earlier how before coming back to San Francisco to join the founding team of Faye, I was living in Mexico City with all creatives and artists and everyone that I met a year ago to, is, is like if you flash forward one more year, that we're like hacking on an NFT project together on our Friday nights and they had no idea what crypto was before. So what's really exciting to me is like new people coming in from like every background, every like walk of life, um, every interest, every like skill set that's really getting into this field and that's what really excites me. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it is also kind of the same thing that I just said as well, but I, I do think that, um, you know, unlocking the potential uh, of an organizational structure like a DAO in, and this may be a crazy kind of prediction, but I think in the next 30 years, you're gonna see about 25% of US GDP going through DAOs. Uh, and that is kind of in the same vein as what, uh, what amount of GDP goes through LLCs currently. And, and when we can unlock that with a new capital structure, with a new organizational structure, um, you know, the, the world is kind of limitless in terms of what you can do and how work looks. Uh, and everybody talks about the future of work and what that means for knowledge workers or people who can contribute in whatever way uh, they can. And, and I think that's contributing through a DAO. Uh, I think identity is a really big category that if we're talking about things that are like gonna peak soon, I think identity is one of those categories that's potentially gonna uh, gonna peak soon. And uh, it's there's a couple of big problems. There's a problem with uh, traditional internet where uh, you don't know if somebody is actually themselves or not. Um, and there's all kinds of fake profiles on Facebook and other places like that. And then there's a problem in the crypto world where uh, you know uh, 100% that a particular wallet, the holder, the owner of a particular private key is taking certain actions, but you don't know who that person is uh, or have any verified information about them. So there's like a problem in the old world and a problem in the new world. Uh, and uh, blockchain-based identity, I think, can uh, potentially be a game changer for both. Um, so yeah, that's probably my pick. Thank you. I've got one more question, then we're going to open it up to the floor for any of you guys that may have um, Q&A. I always like asking smart people this one. Uh, what books would you recommend to the audience out there? Or things that you might say, hey, read this if you, you know, whether that's being a founder, crypto in general, or. So this is a really easy one for me right now um, because I just recently fell down the Ray Dalio changing world order rabbit hole. Um, so if you have talked to me in the past month, you've probably had to hear me talk about it. Um, so yeah, I'd have, to, I'd have to pick that one. It basically, it's basically like, a mathematical view of history, and it's like far better than what historians and political science experts have because it's based on math. So it's just a lot more useful, and it's a model, and um, yeah, it'll uh, change your view on history. This is cringe, but I have this pinwheel of the five processes for the principles <laughs> uh, like taped on my desk. So. I like that as an answer. Yeah, basically what happened is is that like this like mass this guy who has, who's a hedge fund manager and has this massive data set on the entire world got super old and got super worried about the world and decided to share it with us. Whereas a normal move for a hedge fund manager would just be keep it and invest and I think he just got old enough that he decided to share it with us. So we should we should be very lucky for that. Second that. Uh, that's a great read. Um the one that I thought was most enjoyable kind of recently, but it's also super illuminating is uh, 10 maps that change the world. And it's effectively the different maps of different eras of different nations. And it's kind of along the same lines of, you know, who was in power and why based on the technology that they had and sort of the position that they had in the world. Um, and it's just a fascinating study basically through geography of, of the history of kind of hegemony throughout different nation states throughout the world. So mine is super cliche, and I'm almost embarrassed to say it, but um, I think the four-hour work week really like helped me a ton. Um, being able to learn how to delegate, especially in a founding position, and having so many things that you have to do is extremely important. So that one's always good for me. Thank you guys so much um, for your patience, not only with me, um, but also sharing all the uh, you know great insight for these folks. Uh, please start raising some hands. Let's get some questions from the general audience. If there's anyone who has. Anybody like pass these folks? You, sir. I have a, so you mentioned at one point you went through like a period where the technology caused some problems. I just thought it'd be cool to hear more about what that was like at the time. I don't know how you guys. Oh, technology caused some problems. Yeah, we broke we broke the blockchain that we were on, and um, the entire blockchain went down, and then they had to repair it for like seven weeks. It was pretty bad. <laughs> 
that is bad. <laughs> Yeah, and, and we picked it, so, you know, it wasn't like we could just blame somebody else, like, you know, so we looked bad, too. And um, it never got, I guess, fully fixed, and we wound up deploying most things on Ethereum. So, um, yeah, not, not a glorious period. Thank you. Royce. Uh, yeah, quick question. I know you guys mentioned parents, uh, the guy who's going up to be our grandparent in the White House is getting ready to make some... Uh, Regulations in the beginning of February. I'm curious, um, <laughs> what do you guys think is coming? Keep on framing. Um. I think generally what's going to happen, especially with that, is going to be requests for research and less actual action. Yeah, that's exactly what our GC told us this morning. So I'm going to just plus one to that. <laughs> I think we're, our lawyers are probably in some of the same clubs. Uh, but, it, but it does seem like there's potentially some DeFi regulation that's being contemplated. It feels to me like there's a war right now in the, like amongst the like pro-business versus the like not as pro-business Democrats. So uh, I think it's like kind of hard to tell exactly which direction they're gonna go because they're like actively fighting with each other publicly right now. Yeah, it's gonna take a lot of time for anything to happen is what I've been told. That's always good. <laughs> Uh, so this is for the founders mainly. How do you feel like the ideation and validation process for um, your startup, like at the beginning, was different for um, like a crypto application or a DAP um, than it is for like a Web two SaaS? Mm, maybe I'll change. Maybe I'll answer a slightly different question. I think there's a pretty big difference between a B two B and a B two C. Um, uh, discovery process potentially because like for a b2b like you should basically be able to get people to agree like they would pay you even before you build it um, in fact I think you probably shouldn't start building until you at least have talked to some and they want to pay you for it um, whereas for a b2c like you can't ask people because they have no idea and they won't know until they see it and even then a lot of people won't get it until it's better so um, yeah tougher for b2c I don't really think there's a response on my end for this, just because we're a stable coin. Everyone knows that there's like a ton of stable coins out there. Everyone's trying to be innovative, create an algorithmic stable coin um, that's decentralized. There's been a lot of alternatives. So I don't really think there's a translation for that in, uh, in the web too. Please, back there. Dave, you were an engineer before, and you're now a founder. What thing would you focus on I would suggest getting an executive coach early on in the process. I think it's really helpful as well just to learn, just to take your engineering skills aside and focus on more of the business side of things and have someone that's on your side and super supportive that's not maybe as tied in as much, like not drinking the same Kool-Aid as you every day. I think it's like super important to get outside of your circles and try to get advice and mentorship from people that aren't in this space like we are every single day. It's really important to do that. I would do the sales yourself, like early, like for the company, like I would do that yourself. Uh, I think you'll like learn a ton and like eventually you need to manage that part of the business too. So. Um, early on especially. You'll be the best at it anyway, so uh, that'd be my advice. Maybe read a sales book, too. <laughs> if not sales, customer support. Yeah. Uh, this question for Michael, actually. What's more important, what's the most important part for you while uh, pitching, when start raising? What's the most important factor for you? Assuming it was Max. Yeah, so <clears throat> I think... Uh, in retrospect, looking back at all of the founders that we've spoken with and, and ones we've chosen to work with, uh, I think the best heuristic of success, or at least success thus far, is the maniacally competitive spirit that they can showcase. Um, and the more competitive they are, the better, frankly. Um, because if they're more competitive with themselves and versus other people, they're going to be the best versions of themselves and they can figure it out. Was that advice to get five term sheets in a deal? That's why. I, that's how I took that. Isn't that like the McKinsey kind of go-to-market strategy too? Hire all the college athletes. I, 
I, I don't know about athletes, but I, I think generally, so yeah, here, here's an example. Um, you know, we, we uh, invested in a company called Synthetics, uh, started by a guy named Kane Warwick, um, got introduced to his three younger uh, brothers who started Alluvium, which is a game, um, and we invested in that as well. Uh, Alluvium is now bigger than Synthetics, even though it started about a year and a half afterwards, and he, Kane and his brothers are not on great speaking terms right now. <laughs> I have a meme to share with you about the Alluvium Kane uh, relationship. Um, you, sir. Yeah, thanks. Um, a lot of companies right now are witnessing sort of the bottlenecks of cross chain on racket solutions for consumer payments. I'm just wondering how much you feel like that's holding the industry back and how that's been addressed. So sorry, consumer payments, bottleneck based on technology? Well, cross chain on racket for consumer payments. So for us, our focus is to be really good at one thing, and right now we're focusing on DeFi. So that's not something that I'm spending too much time thinking about right now. Someone else will solve it, but we're going to be really good, and we're going to win DeFi. That's kind of the goal for us. I think I have an unpopular view on that. Um, my favorite types of views, yeah. Uh, which, is, which is that uh, I think the way that the competition is going to create uh, competing layer ones is uh, dramatically... Uh, damaging the user experience by putting users on dozens and dozens of different blockchains, and the incentive is to keep going. Like the incentive is to uh, disinteroperate. Um, actually, now there's a lot of great stuff and layer twos and all kinds of other good things happening as well. Uh, but there's a massive financial incentive uh, to not do that, and um, I think Unstoppable is suffering uh, because of this. Uh, it's way way harder um, to provide uh, to provide like good apps for users because of this problem. Yeah, it's really hard to be good at everything to just kind of like add back on to my point. So our focus is on like layer one Ethereum right now. So for us with our, we're all resource constrained, right? So for us to put all of the effort into all of these other L2s and um, other multi-chain multi strategies, it's just not feasible for us. So we're focusing, putting all of our resources there, and then we're going to like partner to maybe build out. But right now we're, we're thinking about L1 and going to move to L2 later. Only thing I'd add to those other great points is um, I think consumer payments is actually going to be one of the last problems that we solve, um, mostly because the scale and the therefore transaction costs that are required to do it at scale uh, are just so untenable at the way that blockchains are working right now that it's probably years away from being viable, um, at which point we'll figure out which blockchain won. <laughs> Founder is harder. But I'm a sole founder. So, uh, what do you think about? Is any of you sole founder as well? Or and what do you think about being sole founder? Is it really hard, or it's just me? <laughs> I'm not personally a, a solo founder. I actually haven't tried it. Uh, tried it yet. Um, I could see. I, I, I think there's benefits to to both directions. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, not me either. I think I kind of alluded to this earlier. I think like early on, it was like Seb, Joey, and I, and the circles that we brought in to help us through through tough times to, to get where we are today, which was like extremely important. So I don't think we would be here today if it wasn't for all of us really grinding together. Likewise for me, I think you, you can kind of figure out the the ways to compensate for that by finding a great initial set of people to surround yourself with. Um, and whether that's a co-founder or whether that's an initial set of great people, it, it can be solved. I have a question that kind of builds off that. Um, what do you think makes like a good set of co-founders? Or is there any, like I guess, recommendation or advice you have for finding a good co-founder to work with and really establishing that relationship? Technical Spend a leader. lot of just spend a lot of time with them before you commit to anything. Like I think you're going to be spending a lot of time together, so make sure that it's a really good fit and as much as you can. Like maybe even like rent a place together for a week, or you know try to like spend a lot of close time together. I think it's good if you have a technical leader and a business leader. And uh, I've personally only done it with people that I was friends with for ten years before. Um, I know there's other ways out there to do it, but that's what I've personally chosen. Yeah, I mean it, it's cliche, but finding your co-founder is kind of like getting married. And so you want to find someone who has complementary skill sets, whatever those may be, for whatever you're trying to solve, um, and someone he can just trust, like, in, implicitly. 
I think we'll take two more questions. Um, I appreciate you guys' time to this point. And then um, if you have two more, go crazy, waving your hand right here. Hi. Uh, how did you manage risk before starting the company? Were you like, you know, I'm going to have this much savings before I jump into this so that if it doesn't work? Uh, I have a fallback strategy at least for a while, especially in your case as well. You were a product manager in Facebook and Snapchat. So. I brought my my uh, spend to an absurdly low level. I was I didn't have a kitchen when I started the company. I just had like a you know room I was renting. So I just uh, got my expenses really low, and then I had a I had a few years, but didn't want to keep living like that. So glad it didn't take you know longer than a couple of years to you know get some you know get somewhere. Yeah, we started framework in my parents' basement. So same idea. Yeah, I mean, we're always very cognizant of our runway, and we don't have that many expenses, to be honest. It's just salaries in our office, and other than that, like, that's it, and we're, we know what it is at all times. No kitchen is. It's... <laughs> most, most rooms have kitchens. Yeah, that's great. Um, and last question. Hey, right there. Very quick. Hello. Um... Good general how to get into crypto, I guess, for those curious. Go to stuff like this. Yeah, and meet and meet people and start talking to companies. The biggest thing you gotta figure out is what kind of job you want. Like what part of the what part of an organization you want to work work on. That's the thing that's gonna prevent uh, a company a company trying to give you a job from uh, knowing which one to give you. Uh, just on top of that, like going to events like this, but also in like the online world as well. So go join the discords, start contributing, start being active, say GM to everybody, like just be involved, know what's going on, start holding some tokens, maybe vote on proposals, suggest proposals, just like start like being part of different communities. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. I think you can, anyone can contribute in whatever way they can. It could be even just like making memes, if that's something that you're into. And any contribution is usually widely appreciated within the communities. And so anyone can kind of start doing whatever they want to do. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, really, really appreciate your time. Please, folks, give it up for these <laughs> wonderful founders. Thanks to the Chainlink yeah, group. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. And we have this space until about 8 p.m. There is tons of Golden Boy pizza. I hope you're hungry. I think I am. Um, get out there. Please mingle. Talk with amongst yourselves. Um, and once again, thank you to these uh, wonderful founders for being up here and sharing all their wisdom.